Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Fazekas, the night sky guy here for Astronomers Without Borders for our big Global Astronomy Month Facebook finale. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are around the world. It's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you have clear skies. You've been doing some stargazing, maybe doing some observing from your bedroom window, maybe your balcony, perhaps your backyard. Uh, I hope you've gone out and done some really nice things and learned some things about the cosmos, the universe we live in, the amazing night sky that we all share around the world. Of course, you know, we're all in lockdown, physically isolating ourselves, but of course, you know, here at Astronomers Without Borders, we don't believe that we should be socially distancing. And thankfully with today's internet technology, we're able to join each other, at least virtually uh, connect and uh, really uh, live our motto here at AWB, which is one people, one sky. And astronomy is an amazing tool that can bring people together, uh, inspire, educate, and bring hope as well. And I hope you all are staying safe and healthy wherever you are watching this broadcast. Today, I've got a very special guest joining me. Um, uh, Bettina Forger is a visual artist. She is a gallery owner, an art educator, and a researcher who's living in and working in Montreal, Canada, where I am, in a different part of town, but uh, here uh, in, in, in the same city. Uh, and her, Bettina's, what's really cool is Bettina's creative work focuses on space, uh, space sciences. And it's, it, it, many of it, of her work, much of her work is really uh, inspired by her, um, her journey through uh, as, uh, amateur astronomy. So I want to invite uh, here, uh, Bettina, are you there? I'm here, hi. Hey, good to great. see you. <laughs> good to see you too. How are you doing in, in this crazy times we're living? You know, you get used to the new normal. It was weird at first, but now I'm, I'm settled in. I'm getting used to seeing my friends in little rectangular boxes on Zoom. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not alone. You have a, you have a friend with you, eh? Yes, I feel like a very furry friend who's <laughs> napping near the front door because she really wants to go out now. And she'll go out <laughs> a little later. <laughs> That's a good. So t tell us a little bit about your your uh, your background, your journey into with astronomy and art. Uh, I, I've known you for 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 I don't know almost like about twenty years now, I think. <laughs> and we we were both uh, we both met each other at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Montreal Center, uh, for a shared interest in in outreach of astronomy and. And we were very interested. So, but you, your journey has gone to amazing places. So, just give us a give us a little taste of of your background. Well, I'm a trained artist. Um, I come from a family of artists, but I always had an interest in astronomy. Uh, but because I was an artist and a girl, like that was not really picked up by my family. And it was only until I was in my twenties that I bought my first telescope. I lived in Singapore at the time. Uh, and <clears throat> had the telescope, didn't know what to do with it, joined the astronomy club there, the Singapore Astronomy Society, and it was wonderful. So when I moved to Canada, the first thing I did is like, there must be another astronomy club. So we're I We're everywhere, we're everywhere, amateur we're everywhere. <laughs> and what is so lovely about this, uh, amateur astronomers is they are so much like artists. They're so passionate about what it is they're doing. Uh, my artist friends are really passionate about art and they live and breathe making art and amateur astronomers that live and breathe, you know, um, their telescopes and observing and they go out at the dead of winter in Canada to do the Messier challenge. It's like the same kind of nut. Uh, so that's what I loved. And in my, um, my day job and my night job, uh, what I do during the day and during the night is very linked as well, because during the day I'm an artist. I, um, uh, I run a gallery in Montreal that only shows art that makes a connection to science. And uh, I'm doing a PhD at Concordia right now, um, teaching art with science together. So everything kind of connects. And uh, with this, uh, I'm associated also with the SETI Institute's Artists in Residence program. So SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So it's a search for life out there. 
and uh, they have a fantastic artist in residence program. So uh, for the last four years, I've now been associated with them. So my life is really right at the intersection of art and astronomy. Oh my gosh, you're living the dream then, your, your passion. I know, I know. As a kid, I wanted to be an artist and an astronaut. Kind of done. <laughs> hey, yeah. And you know, there's more to come. You never know about that, right? You never know. You never you know. know. Would you go into space? In a heartbeat. Sign me up now. Wow. But I must say that with a telescope, I found that you are traveling without moving. I feel like when you're looking through the telescope, like that live experience is very much like being, a, being an astronaut. And if you have a big telescope, like I've got my um, Orion, my, my Dobsonian behind me, and I see Andrew, you've got like your collection behind you too. Um, with the right eyepiece, you can get a view that is so close to the moon, for example, that it feels like you're, you know, orbiting it in, in yeah. a space capsule. Yeah. I mean, so, that's that's it, eh? I mean, it's like you can't, you feel like you're like, a, well, maybe like one of those Apollo astronauts, right? 50 yeah. years ago. That's right. You know? Like Michael Collins, just, you know, like orbiting and looking down. Looking down. That's right. Yeah. Oh, and we got a question too, quickly. San, Sandeep uh, is asking, can astronomy be practiced by everyday people? You know, do you need to be trained in it? I'm an everyday person. I mean, I'm trained in the fine arts. I have a degree from a university in the arts, but uh, I'm, I'm so loving astronomy that, you know, when I just bought my telescope, I bought a book first about uh, astronomy, like um, Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. Oh, yeah, um, fellow Canadian, that's right. Fellow Canadian, so it's really accessible. So it has star maps on the back and give, gave me good ideas about like what telescopes am I wanna buy? And I just, you know, you can teach yourself as much as you like. You can, you know, just put your toe in the pool and just say, I just want to know a little bit about constellations and look at the moon. Or you can go whole hog like me and, you know, I ended up, um, you know, auditing courses at McGill in astronomy um, and bought myself astronomy books. Like, yeah, yeah. like this is my, this is my Chase Nut Macmillan, you know. Ooh, that looks yeah, that's serious. A good one. That's yeah, serious I, reading. So, so I got serious, but you don't have to get serious. You know, you do as much as you want. Well, you know, that's actually a great segue, uh, Bettina, because I wanted to share with folks uh, this wonderful little video that you, uh, you put online a little while ago that caught my attention, uh, really uh, tugged at my heartstrings because it really captures the intimacy that uh, uh, looking at the night sky can be, a, that you're, uh, how personal, right? I mean, that, that's something... I think we all as amateurs, even beginners, people who are new, is it's, it's, it is a deeply personal journey too. And I think, whoops, hold on, I'm getting a, who's calling me now? I'm not, <laughs> bad time, talk later. This is, <laughs> but, but it's incredible because I, I wanna show this maybe, and uh, uh, let's run this video. I don't wanna talk too much, watch this. It's called Mile End Moon and it's all about urban, stargazing, what it can be like for a person. Check this out. I should have brought popcorn. <laughs> I'm one of those people who love looking at the moon. I totally am. I love setting the razor thin crescent moon in the early evening, just before it melts into the horizon. And the big fat full moon reflecting off the downtown skyscrapers like a celestial headlight. And I love seeing the moon during the day. A reminder that the stars are still there, even though the sun is still up. Though my favorite way to see the moon is with my telescope. I have an eight inch Dobsonian. Just imagine a rocket launcher on a lazy Susan and you get the idea. And even though I live in a third story walk up, I still do a fair amount of sky watching. I just set up my scope on the fire escape. I have to climb through my bedroom window to set up and the tube usually gets a bit dinged in the process but it's totally worth the effort. Move the potted plants, squeeze in the folding chair, glass of wine, there. So here I am, glued to the side of my apartment building, perched on a cast iron metal grate, floating over a bustling shopping street in Montreal's Highland. I'm both looking down and looking up. Tonight is a clear night and the moon is visible between the two condo high rises on my left and the apartment building across the street from me. The air is pretty dry, which is good. 
sometimes when the air is sticky, there's so much humidity in the atmosphere that it's like seeing the moon underwater. It kind of swims through the viewfinder. I like to sketch at the eyepiece. It's a quiet, meditative experience. I become totally absorbed. The bustling squeak below just kind of fades away. As I sketch, the moon travels through the eyepiece fairly fast, especially at high magnification. Actually, that's not right. The moon doesn't move. I see the Earth turning. The telescope is a transportation device. When I stack my super fossil eyepiece on top of the barrel lens, I get so close to the moon, I feel like I'm orbiting it in a space capsule. I sometimes wonder what it would be like to actually go there or to live there. Only 12 people have ever gone to the moon. It's really too bad we stopped exploring. The old moon program may get a boost from a recent discovery. Did you hear about the water that was discovered on the moon? Yes, the place looks pretty dry and gray, especially now when you look through the telescope. But right there at the South Pole, where you can't see, there's water. It is hidden in a few craters that are so deep that the sun's rays never reach it. I think it was NASA who discovered it. What was the mission called again? Something cross. Oh yes, L cross. They jettisoned a missile into one of the craters and the plume of moon dust that shot up was full of hydrogen. Water on the moon, imagine that. Once you have water, you could totally live there. Set up a moon colony right in the crater. It would be pretty dark though, like Iceland in winter. Oh, did I tell you I was in Iceland two years ago for residency? You know what would be a great job? Artist in residence of a moon colony. I totally sign up for that. How about you? Would you pack your bags and come and live in a moon crater with me? Yes, to bring the wine. I wonder what color moon water would be. I mean, it's blue on Earth because it reflects the sky. Or is it because oxygen is blue? I kind of imagine the giant blue iceberg clinging to the crater wall. Now that would be a great sketch. Oops, sorry, did I get that on you? How do you mean you can't see? Hang on. Did you play with the focus? Ah, no, that's a cloud. Yeah, there's a bank of clouds moving in from the east. Well, talk about water. I guess that's it. Show's over. Time to get back to Earth. Let's go back inside. I look for another one. Hey, that is so good. Thanks. That is so good. That, and you know what? That, um, to me, really captures um, what what it's a what what it's about really you know about being able to to um you know like let your mind and imagination kind of go you know and think about the possibilities i i have to say i really like the the effect of it looked like um you look like you had a, like a flashlight actually going on the moon and you're like scanning with your flashlight it was really cool thanks yeah it was just my iphone held up to the uh eyepiece really that's it yes that's all i did and so you know i did some screen grabs from that and later did some sketching from it but i thought for this little podcast that i wanted to turn it more into a video and give it a visual and so to have really clear like nicer images at the back but the more like more wine i drank and the more i started to imagine things and it sort of started to cloud over that the images were getting more fuzzy and fuzzy to the end of uh, the, yeah the, the creative juices were setting in right, right. <laughs> hey and, and what um what instrument were you using was it that scope in behind you that scope behind me it's an eight inch dobsonian and uh so that it fits right on my fire escape. But my fire escape is wide enough that it's like a little balcony, but I do have to, like, I don't have a door. So I really have to like lift everything like over my, uh, over the little wall, like, you know, and it does get dinged a little bit, but it's fine. And I set, set myself up nice. And then I can spend hours just looking at the moon when it's right, when it's not, you know, behind the condos or, you know, because the moon, even like I'm fairly central in Montreal. Um, right over there is a big shopping street. We have street lights. Um, it's fun for me to look down from my little perch and see people with their shopping bags and, you know, going walk, walk, walking arm in arm and going to bars and things. And, and then I'm looking up and I'm, I'm looking at the moon 
uh, at the same time. And like, you know, uh, you can see it just as well from a totally dark location as you can from a very urban location perched on a third story walk up. Right, right. And what, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, I mean, you, the moon, I know, has been something very central in your career, too. I mean, you've, you, it's been an inspiration for, for work that you've done, hasn't it? That's right. So um, it started, of course, the moon is an obvious target if you're an amateur astronomer. And then I started drawing it. Um, and then you, I started contemplating it because when you draw, um, it really slows you down. You really observe more, but you also think more. You have all that time to think about what it is that I'm drawing. And also I'm always like um, looking at my Ruckel star atlas, so moon atlas, right? To, to see like, what is that crater that I'm actually noting down? And so I had a couple of thoughts about, you know, colonization of the moon and like mile end moon is more about like, what if you could live there? But when I was doing a lot of my drawings, I also wondered like who these uh, craters are named after because all the craters on the moon, they're named after people. And so one day I wondered how many of these people are women? Ah, yes. And, I will... and what did you find out? What did I find out? So I went to the International Astronomical Union who have a website where have, they have the uh, Lunar Gazetteer that all the named craters, like all of them listed, and I counted them by hand. Um, at that time, when I did the, with the, the count, 1,605 moon craters were cataloged. Guess how many of them are named after women? Uh, no idea. What? There must be a lot, I would think. I mean, no? 29. What? Are you serious? 1.8 percent. Wow. Yeah. So oh. I was really surprised. Like I, you know, I know that women are rather underrepresented in the sciences and in astronomy, but I, I thought like this is really low, um, and this is not okay with me. Um, so what can I do about it? Like I can, you know, write an angry, angry Facebook post. Wag my at the moon, yell from uh, my 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 balcony is like, what is going on? Uh, but I'm an artist, so I thought, why don't I make some art about it? And so I decided to draw um, the, all the moon craters named after women. That one plus, I'm also including the um, Sally Wright impact crater, um, oh. where the trail mission went down and, and left an impact. So I, I'm calling it 30, so 1.9%. Yeah. Of, of I think we have. I think we have a few examples. Uh, maybe run, run, show a few of those. Um, yeah, let's see if we can, there we are, there we are. That's right, yeah, so uh, yeah, Levitt Crater. So what I noticed, um, so first of all, half of these craters are on the far side of the moon. I was really hoping to be able to draw all of them with my telescope, but you know, unfortunately, I do not have my own spacecraft. So I went to um, a website run by NASA that has really great images of the moon, and so I, I picked, um, my, my resources, my resource images from there. And then I started to basically draw different portraits of moon craters. And you can see how different they all are. I mean, you, you think of a classic moon crater more like a hole in the ground, but these are all so individual and um, they made just a lovely series. So I'm, I'm very glad that I decided to, um, you know, uh, I've always done drawing at the eyepiece and then I took it into the next step and do some really like larger drawings, which were actually exhibited at the uh, Montreal Planetarium for over a year. Wow. And so how long does it take you to actually uh, sketch out one of these? Uh, it takes about like I, I do like uh, a day. Uh, day and a half so the, the actual drawing but then there's like the research like getting the best images. Um, they have different lunations, so sometimes half of the crater will be in the shade and it's like not a nice drawing, so I'm going to wait and get a better image of it. So, um, yeah, um, it, it, it took a while, like all, uh, all in all, it took about a year for me to, to finish this entire series. Oh my goodness. So in your series, have you covered all, what was it, 29 crater? Uh, yeah, I, I included uh, uh, Sally Wright, so it's uh, it's thirty uh, in all. So I did all of them, 
And um, yeah, I talked about that whole project and at the Montreal Space Symposium. And so the director of the Montreal Planetarium was there and he's a big feminist and he goes like, we need these in the planetarium. And uh, it was nice to see them all exhibited together. And it brought um, art out of the art gallery and showing art in the science environment was really interesting because so many people who may not go to an art gallery suddenly were seeing artworks, but it was about astronomy. So it was a nice intersection there. I can imagine. Uh, do you, have you heard anything about maybe more name naming going on for women at, on the moon or? Yeah, actually I'm pushing, I'm working on a project called Doubling Down. Like I want the I, uh, uh, IAU to name more moon craters after women. So that's that's a that's a thing that I'm working on. A little bit of uh, activism now. Um, Yay! Yes. yes <laughs> I think we can, you know, push it up to three point eight percent. That should be possible. <laughs> I'm not being greedy. <laughs> that's interesting. Very interesting. So and and uh, and so, where has this taken you? I mean, this uh, the, the idea of craters. I mean, there's a. Uh, I know that it's it's gone beyond just drawing craters, right? Yeah, so when I was finished with the drawings, um, you know, I was really happy with this. And then, you know, I had this idea for phase two, that, but that's more research-based. And I said, what I'd always wanted is just to hold one in my hand. I'd love to just hold a crater, cause a crater is like an absence and it's called women with impact, the whole series, because it's like these women who made an impact in their field, but also you make uh, the craters made through an impact, like a physical impact. So I wanted to have something three-dimensional. And uh, I decided to 3D print the craters. Wow. So That's I have different. actually behind me, so I, and I've started, um, and I can show you some. So for example, oh, we actually, you, so you saw Resnick Crater, uh, that was one of the drawings. And this is yeah. one of the, um, like the, the 3D prints. Oh, yeah. Right? So and it really changes as light as the light as you're moving it. You exactly. can see that you see different uh, regions of the crater and some in their yeah. shadow. And that is exactly um, why I'm so interested in having the three D ones. And I maybe I'm gonna have like a light that moves, so you can really see like how the craters um, are affected by light, right? And how I mean, I mean, as a, as an amateur, I'm just thinking now. You know, my mind's kind of racing. It's like, wow, because I think when I go to the telescope and I look at the moon, I'm looking usually along the Terminator line, yeah. right? For to see those kind of effects, those shadows. That's the shadow, the uh, line between the day side and the unlit side of the moon, which moves right. along during as the phases of the moon, right? During the month. They, uh, they kind of shift along and you see different shadings, just like what you were showing there. Yeah, uh, here, we've got an, another one, this is Jenkins. So you can see how different it is. And you can see more like the secondary cratering and the terraced walls. Like this is like, I'm using a, a filament that is more silver. I have <clears> another <throat> one that is like, a, uh, this is Hypatia, this one is white. Uh, I, I think the camera just overexposes it a little yeah, bit. Like that, you can see. Yeah, I'm seeing yeah. more of it. Yeah, yeah. The see content. more. Yeah. Uh, really three, really three dimensional, definitely. Yeah. And so you don't see that when you're looking through the telescope because you're seeing really a 2D image, right? Because you're seeing it through the eyepiece and the way your brain processes it is more 2D. But having um, a three dimensional uh, moon crater printout, I think, is just. Like it's more useful for you to comprehend what it is you're looking at. And I just love holding a piece of the moon in my hand. That just really gives me a kick. I just, yeah, just like, this is really awesome. So where does the, the files, where, the, how you, I mean, I know that 3D printing, they use as like files, right? Yes. Files. So how do you get those? That's like for the specific craters. Yeah, so that took me a while to figure out. Um, I uh, in, initially, uh, so what you need, to do these craters is you need LIDAR data. So this is data that was made with a laser and they sort of shoot the laser down to the ground. And so they can take measure, measurements about you know, like what that surface looks like. Um, and that data was available, but it wasn't, I wasn't able to make 3D printing files out of it. So there's like, like conversion issues and that took me a whole long time. And then uh, this December, I was in San Francisco in an art residency, which does a lot of new media and 3D printing and things, and there I figured it out. 
I found a, a NASA JPL website called MoonTrack. And there, if you know the position of the moon, you can like identify it. There you can generate a 3D printing file from the region of the moon that you want. And that's how I managed to um, get all the uh, STL files that I needed to print these out. Oh, they're absolutely beautiful. And what what uh, what is the destiny? What's the destiny for these these uh, these three D prints? So uh, I just want to just basically have the set of them and and show them like the drawings. But I had another idea. So while I was in San Francisco and I was like you know uh, researching, um, I thought, well, I can generate the actual like the the moon crater like this one. Uh, but I could also do the opposite. Like I can, this is like an innie, right? I can do an outie. I can basically do something like the opposite of this. You can see, so here you can see uh, like the crater going out. And if I put this thing on a shoe and I walk with it, I can make moon craters as I'm walking. <laughs> now that is very cool. But you know what they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's watch actually a video Let's run this video of what you're just described because it's, it really makes sense when you see it. It makes sense. And, I, and for the video, I have to say, this was when um, the 3D printer was down. I actually ended up fixing it for the guy. And I made my first um, uh, things like this just with the Sculpty. So um, that's why you see that a little bit rougher. But yeah, go, go roll the video. Yeah, let's, let's, let's check this out. Whoops. There we go. And make sure there's uh, audio. Yeah, I know there's audio here. Yeah, but it's it's more like artsy audio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love this. I recognize those sounds. They're so iconic. Yeah, and this is at uh, Ocean Beach in San Francisco. Look at that! Oh my gosh, that's a moon crater. Yeah, so that's Mondo Crater. And this is basically, I was doing beta testing for this idea and see before I do all the 3D prints, if this idea actually works. And it works. Yeah, so they had Mondo and Resnick Craters strapped to my boots. Yeah, I thought it would be fun to get some images of the tide coming in because this is moon creators. It's about the moon and the moon creates the tides. So th I thought that it would be a nice connection right there. Wow. That is awesome. Nice. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, a uh, lot of fun to make. I can I can see that and oh it's just it's so it's so cool to see those craters and they're formed so perfectly in the sand just like what it looks like through the eyepiece I mean and and this is just amazing because you're you're taking things like you're viewing things you can view them and then you're recreating them and then creating artwork with it uh, the result it's just amazing I mean I wanted to ask you you know before we go I really want to ask you what you know, with this crazy stuff we're, we're experiencing in terms of like, you know, lockdown and we're isolating, how is this, how is this situation really affecting um, your artwork and your work with science? Because you're, you're at the intersection of science and art. And I'm curious, is this impacting it in any way? 
Well, on the one hand, it's giving me more time and breathing space to make more art. Um, you know, I'm not like running around like crazy, um, but it, and it gives me more time to reflect. Like, um, I, I like what you said at the beginning that we all live under the same sky. And I, I find that when you are, uh, when I'm drawing, I'm thinking about like when I'm drawing, I have a lot of thoughts like in that first video. And, you know, I think that somebody in India can look at the moon in the same way and make the same drawing that I'm doing at the same time that I'm doing it. You know, this is like how, how the sky connects us and how we don't spend enough time looking up because we only look, what, like 12%, you know, like eye level and then maybe like, you know, we may look at the billboard. That, that, that's like, that's our, you know, percentage of vision. But if you look up, you see the entire universe, like everything, the entire universe floats above our heads and we never look there. And I find that's weird. So I, you know, I find that through my work, I'm hoping to inspire people to look up more and, you know, get a bigger perspective and, um, and, and participate more. You know, you, like I can, if I can sit on my fire escape and look at the moon, so can you, you know, take, a, take binoculars. You don't need a telescope. You have binoculars floating around somewhere. Already that gives you an amazing view. And um, yeah, I think, um, you know, my, I, I, this lockdown, it's like, it's um, physically distancing, but socially I feel a lot more connected um, because I can do Zoom and, you know, talk to people in, in what, uh, Nigeria and uh, California and Nepal, you know, this is amazing. And, and the night sky does the same thing. It totally is. I, 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 and there's a, I gotta ask you this because uh, we're, we have a question here is, since you're an artist and there are a lot of, I think a lot of people out there with kids as well, families that are stuck at home. Uh, um, there's a question here of innovative ways to create astro art. Do, is there any anything that you could uh, say to people maybe that they could try something? Is there an, an idea that you have that, that they could do in terms of astro art? Yeah, I mean, you can draw from observation. You know, uh, when I started in amateur astronomy, I did a lot of things like just uh, on black paper, just drawing out the constellations and where they are to learn the constellations. And if you even, I think the, the RASC still has a binocular challenge. So if yeah. you have binoculars, you can even see the Orion Nebula and you can sometimes even see the stars within. So uh, with the white pencil on black paper, you can actually do a lot if you wanna do astro art from observation like I do. Uh, and you can also go like astronomy picture of the day and maybe go uh, to astronomy clubs websites and get inspiration actual source material there and then you know imagine you can do things like imagine you're there like imagine you're on the moon what would that look like if you're looking back at the earth um, imagine you're flying around uh, Saturn you know if you're underneath the rings what may that look like uh, so I, I think you know get inspired by that astronomy is a really visual science there's lots of great visual material and just look at it and start drawing from that yeah I mean it's so inspiring to see uh you know and with the with with I think also with the internet right I mean we are connected to amazing places in the universe unlike any time before in humanity's experience right I mean we have the Hubble Space Telescope we've got planetary missions that have gone there and we uh, as the average earthling have uh, access to this. That's I mean, just awesome. like what you were showing with, with the, the JPL data, right? You were mm -hmm. saying with the moon, it's yeah. incredible. You have access to this data that was once, you know, and just for academics, uh, you can, anyone can, you know, if, if, you, if you think out of the box, you can start really doing some amazing things, right? Yeah, and there's even, uh, they have video and they have, um, you know, so many images that if you put them together, you can make your own videos. So if you have kids who like to use like GarageBand or iMovie, um, you don't just have to do drawing and painting. You could do like media arts and uh, like, you know, cut your own uh, space movie with uh, all the materials uh, that are available on the NASA website and, and ESA as well and other space agencies have a lot of free stuff. We live in great times though, you know, I mean, and uh... 
you know, I, I, and it, it really shows, you know, uh, humans are so innovative, uh, such an innovative, we're such innovative species, right? I mean, the things that we can think of, it's incredible, the human mind. And, and I think this is, this is amazing what you've shown us today, Bettina, is that, you know, that intersection between science and art, it's, it's very strong. And I think with, as we're moving out into space, it's just sparking humanity's imagination even more. Right. That's right. I, because I think creativity is the basis for both art and science. You know, um, the more creative you are, the more innovative you are. Uh, ex, you know, scientists experiment, artists experiment. Uh, so we do so many of the things the same. And I think training in one discipline will help you in the other. Totally. totally. And Petia, before I let you go, what, uh, what's next for you? What's the big, next big adventure that you have planned? I know you're always cooking up something. So... Um, actually, I'm, I'm sort of moving a little bit into astrobiology uh, as part of my PhD. Um, I'm doing uh, workshops that combine art and astrobiology. So we're imagining aliens and alien places based on real science. Um, I'm associated with the SETI Institute, so they're actually helping me to put together the, um, you know, they're advising me, they're, they're doing the science advising, but it's going to be an arts-based workshop. Um, that, that connects art and astrobiology. So I'm very excited to get uh, get that going. Oh my gosh, you know what that means. You're gonna have to come back again. That sounds, <laughs> astrobiology, <laughs> okay. You, you, I think you've sold most of us on that. We're gonna have to learn what you're gonna be up to. And if we want to look at what you're up to, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me uh, at bettinafogé.com, just my name.com. Awesome. We'll definitely we'll put the, a link uh, to to that to your site uh, below here in the comments section. Bettina, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure. It is so much fun to have you, and you do so many cool things. Uh, I wish you all the best. We'll talk very soon, I'm sure. Thank yes. you. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much for everyone joining us for this Global Astronomy Month finale. Uh, we had a great time. 2020 was, uh, version is, was a little different from what I think what we've had the 10 past years. But I think it shows that we can persevere and uh, we're very imaginative, all of us out there. And with our outreach, astronomy outreach is uh, more important than ever. And I think today's uh, situation really tells us that uh, we are all connected. We're all in this together. Uh, and we can only, we can just look up at that sky, that moon, that star and planet that you see is the same one that your friends and family across town, across the country, across the world sees just like you what you are and you are connected through the sky we all are so thank you so much i hope you all stay healthy and safe and until next time i wish you clear skies bye bye <laughs>